There were a lot of claims and counterclaims at the time that Tommy Robinson was jailed. He ended up, he was put in jail uh, only five hours after he was arrested uh, outside Leeds Crown Court back in May. Um, there's been a lot of uh, questions about whether or not this was a political move to silence him. That's what a lot of people, a lot of his supporters, uh, whether here or abroad, have been claiming. There's been a massive petition. Hundreds of thousands of people have signed uh, for him to be released. He's a political prisoner. He's being silenced uh, and, uh, and the like. Is that the case? No, it's not the case. Um, he, his trial at, at Leeds Crown Court in respect of the contempt proceedings was unfair um, and the Court of Appeal uh, overturned that yesterday and uh, have remitted it back in September for a further hearing. So I don't think it's a political prosecution at all. Um, I think that uh, he potentially is in contempt of court and a fresh hearing will be heard in September to decide whether he was or he wasn't. There was a lot of talk about how, because what he was doing at the time outside Leeds Crown Court, again, what he'd been doing outside Canterbury Crown Court so a year or, or earlier, was that he was uh, live streaming, videoing himself, live streaming outside the court, at times inside the court, in the case of uh, Canterbury, where he was uh, talking about uh, Muslim paedophiles, Muslim rapists, talking about men who were currently on trial at the time, who were therefore innocent until proven guilty under our justice system, um, and there was a big fear that he was prejudicing uh, the trials because, of course, no reporters are allowed to, I mean, journalists are allowed to uh, give such reports. You have to report what happens in court and only what happens in court once these cases uh, get to that stage. Um, there was a big fear that he was going to prejudice the outcome of the trial and actually cause these trials to collapse, uh, which would mean actually that the victims of, of, of these uh, perpetrators wouldn't actually get justice at all. And yet the claim was that he had been silenced from speaking out about these Muslim grooming gangs. I think the uh, public needs to understand that reporting restrictions are put, it, put in place by judges for, for very good reasons. And uh, that can often be to protect complainants or victims or witnesses. It doesn't necessarily just mean that they're in place to protect defendants. Um, and if reporting restrictions are breached, that can prejudice the fairness of a trial, which could mean that the whole trial would collapse and guilty people may well walk away and completely in, free. In this case, I believe there were 30 defendants and they were having three different trials uh, running separately at different times uh, and because they simply couldn't manage to have 30 defendants in, in one court. And therefore, the reporting restrictions were there so that the, the reporting of each one of those trials didn't then prejudice the next trial and mean that there was a, a miscarriage of justice there. That's exactly right. So a jury in the second or third trial was not aware of what had happened in the first trial so that they ensure that the defendants do have uh, a fair hearing and that the process of justice runs smoothly. And, and we, we know from what Tommy Robinson said in the state that Tommy Robinson was aware of that. Yes, that, 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 I understand that's the position, yes. And so, OK, so he's going to go back to court in September, although he has been freed, he's already served three months. It may be the case that he doesn't uh, uh, have to go back to jail because he's already served time for, uh, you know, about a, 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 well, a three months of that 30-month sentence. He would realistically only serve about six months of that sentence anyway. Or it may be the case that he gets sentenced to a longer uh, sentence. Uh, my understanding is the judge did indicate yesterday that it was certainly a possibility that he may receive a longer sentence uh, when it, when the new hearing is heard in September, okay. um, it's, it's not. And the first conviction that he, uh, sorry, the first committal that he received in May 2017 from the first trial in Canterbury was actually for a suspended sentence for eight months, for 18 months, mm -hmm. so a three-month term of imprisonment for 18 months, and then the Leeds conviction <laughs> breached that suspended sentence, hence a further 10 months on top. OK, Karen Todd, no human rights and criminal defence lawyer. Thank you very much. Let's just want to establish some of the facts there for those of us who aren't uh, lawyers. And I feel that an awful lot of people discussing this don't have the uh, legal background, including myself. Uh, but let's talk about this now with Jared Batten, UKIP leader, as I say, MEP for London. Jared, um, Tommy Robinson has become something of a cause celeb. But there's a lot of talk, as I was saying to Karen, about him being, you know, a man who's been, you know, been silenced by the establishment, locked up because he's exposing, you know, Asian Muslim uh, grooming gangs. And that's why he's been uh, uh, put in jail. Um, do you believe the decision to jail Tommy Robinson was a political one? Uh, good morning, Julia. I, I think certainly think he was railroaded into jail um, at Leeds. I'm not going to condone actually breaking a reporting restriction, but I think the you said it was a kind of technicality that he got off on yesterday. I think it was a lot more than technicalities. The judge yesterday was pretty scathing about what happened in the Leeds court, which was unusual for a judge to criticise another court in the way that he did. Um, and there were a number of points. Uh, Tommy had agreed to take the video down at the point. Uh, there was insufficient cause, really, to justify immediate proceedings. It should have been adjourned so that the case could be properly considered. There were no particulars of the contempt which he was supposed to have formulated, so he couldn't actually 
say that he had or he hadn't. There was no clarity about what he admitted or didn't admit. He didn't plead guilty because there's no verdict at a contempt. Uh, sorry, there's no plea at a contempt hearing. And um, no, through his no barrister, he admitted. No, no, no. Through his saying. barrister, he admitted the contempt. But you talk about no clarity. That, that actually, the judge yesterday also had criticisms of uh, Tommy Robinson's legal team and himself at the time because he also uh, he was also where they deliberately didn't want there to be clarity because they were going to use that technical well, flaw to then make their appeal. I don't think he had much of a legal team at the time because it was all done within a few hours and he had whatever solicitor was available at the time. The so I don't hardly had a legal team defending him. Well, he did have a legal team defending. He had a. He well, he had, had one a... solicitor, as far as I know. Yeah, OK. But the, the trouble is with this, OK, look, there are many people who may have a lot of concerns about our justice system. And uh, clearly, I mean, clearly, he, he has won that aspect of his appeal. However, we know that um, it, it's very clear what he was, that the crime that he committed is a crime. It's not a civil offence, uh, a, a, a contempt of court. Um, but the, the way this is being played out in terms of the campaigns for Tommy Robinson, of course, his, his real name, I need to point out, Stephen Yaxley Lennon, that's where he was sentenced under and served time under. Um, but uh, it's become something of a cause celebre as, as a poli almost a political prisoner. We see a petition, hundreds of thousands of people on you know, this hashtag, Free Tommy. Uh, we've seen uh, a lot of uh, you know, very sort of far right Republicans in the United States uh, and Canada coming over uh, and very much sort of uh, supporting his cause. Uh, Tommy Robinson, is, is his first big interviews are going to be you know on, on far right channels and the like. Are you concerned that this is whipping up, um, whipping up to a certain level of hysteria where there could actually lead to trouble on the streets? Um, first of all, you use the term far right. Mm. That's used very freely now for anybody that isn't kind of to the left of Jeremy Corbyn. Anybody that has a contrary view to the accepted left wing consensus is called far right. Well, no, I I'm don't. I don't. Use, right. Yeah, but I know a lot of people do, but I don't use that. I've chosen that term quite deliberately. OK, well, I might dispute that. We won't go into details on that. I think what the reason that Tommy Robinson exists is precisely because things that he started to voice some years ago were swept under the carpet by the establishment, both political, the police, the social services. And that's why Tommy Robinson exists, because he is a genuine voice for certain sections of the population who feel that they're being ignored, and indeed that rampant criminality is being ignored. And it was because he had the courage to speak up for those people. And I, I my support for Tommy is always qualified. I mean, you know, I, I've always said that I support him not 100 percent because I don't agree with everything that he does or says. But precisely because he was speaking up for those people is why he's so popular today. I mean, he is rash and he's reckless, but. If he wasn't, he wouldn't have the courage to do what he's actually done. No, I, mean, I, 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 um, I share a number of your, your thoughts on that. I, do, I, I think we can all agree, there's no question at all, that uh, the, the, uh, the absolutely obscene crimes of, of what... And again, people say Asian grooming, it's Muslim grooming gangs, mass paedophile gangs of, yeah. of rapists. That was swept under the carpet because uh, there was a view by the police, the social services and the courts that it, somehow it, was, it, would be, it would be seen as, as racist or Islamophobic to bring... Uh, actions against uh, these people and again and again they were exposed by MPs by, by so individual social workers individual police officers and no action was taken it took a very very brave man in fact a Muslim prosecutor uh, to actually bring these crimes to now I also I, I, I think that Tom Robinson's done great work there I also think he's done great work in terms of exposing the threat of Islamic extremism in this country and the fact that actually a, a lot of these uh, so called moderate Islamic groups are actually being funded by Salafist groups and are actually incredibly dangerous and are pushing forward some very very dangerous ideology. However, the fact that this is now being whipped up, it, it does feel like it's being whipped up as a sort of an anti-Muslim, generally, a pro-white, a sort of, or it, it's, it's, it's got the feel, certainly with the support of some, uh, some groups in America and Canada now, of a, a sort of, a, it's got the feel of a white supremacist movement well, now. Does that not well, worry you? you? Well, if you'd have actually turned it turned out to one of the rallies, I've been to three or four of these now, you'll find people there of all different backgrounds. You'll find black people, you'll find Asian people. It's got nothing to do with white supremacy. This is an, I'm sure this is another m m uh, mainstream media narrative that will be trotted out. No, 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 Gerald, please don't. Issues. I'm not mainstream media narrative at all. You know I'm not. I'm well, always plain speaking. Relief. But, no, but... The but the, but the point but the point is I, I see the tweets from the people who support Tom Robinson and a lot of them I'm sure are very 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 good people who, who want the best for their country and are genuinely scared and worried about about the changes that are happening in this country changes which I'm concerned about as well but there are also some people who are frankly outright blatant racists 
Well, there always has been, and you've got people in the Labour Party now who are flagrant, outright yeah. anti-Semitic. There's always a minority of people, and I think I was just having this discussion with yesterday. In the Labour Party now, you thought all this thing is dead and buried, and then it becomes possible because of the Labour Party is being soft on this in that these people come out from under out of the woodwork again. So there'll always be a minority of people like that, but that doesn't mean the majority are wrong because the limit of what the minority might say. And, of course, they're the ones that are always given the coverage yes. and the airtime because they say something outrageous. But if you mingled with the people at a Tommy Robinson rally, you find that they're not actually like that. You'll get a few, certainly. You'll get a few drunken louds. But I'm afraid you get the same thing at a football match. But that doesn't mean that everyone who's at a football match is a bad person. Well, what is, what is the key message that Tommy Robinson is, is uh, attempting to deliver to the people of Britain? Because he's had his YouTube channel shut down. He's had his Twitter account shut down. Yeah. Uh, there's no doubt at all that uh, he, uh, he is... There, there are, I think, absolutely clear attempts to close down his voice. But he, he is still... He's got a huge following, uh, many millions of people, I think, uh, are very supportive of him, maybe not in public, but but in private. What do you think the message is that he wants the uh, the British establishment, the British media, the British politicians that he wants them right. to hear that they are not hearing? Well, I think I can't speak for Tommy, but I think it might be similar to what I'm trying to do, maybe in in, in a less flamboyant way, which is that we actually confront the dangers of fundamentalist extremist Islamic ideology in our countries which is what's really threatening us now and going forward because it's becoming more prevalent. And we, are now, we have imported into our country a dark age Arabian ideology, uh, which is now causing us severe problems and will cause Europe severe problems going forward. And the political establishment have to think about how they're going to tackle that. But the last thing they want to do is to admit that it actually exists. But you're talking about Islamic extremism when you're talking about that ideology, not yeah. ordinary Muslim families living in Britain peacefully. No, of course not, because I've always talked about the ideology, and you can look at anything I've said or anything I've written, and I always talk about the ideology. The problem is, is that they all belong to a, a belief system which contains these extremist teachings. Now, they may not adhere to them, and most of them don't, but the problem is it is part of their ideology. OK, um, I'm just on a, on a different note, if I, I can, just finally, um, there is a lot of talk about UKIP going up in the polls. There's lots of Conservative yeah. voters in particular, and indeed uh, a Brexit voters who perhaps don't have any other party allegiance, uh, move away from the Conservatives, angry about the Prime Minister's checkers deal. There's been some talk of Nigel Farage coming back, either to lead UKIP again or possibly form his own party. If Nigel Farage, if, if, if the Prime Minister doesn't deliver on Brexit in any meaningful way, as many voters, I think most voters now don't expect that she will, would you stand down to allow Nigel Farage to come back to lead UKIP if he was the best hope of getting Brexit delivered? Right. Let me just a couple of your points there. First of all, we don't just want convert conservative voters. We want voters from across the board and members from across the board. And I'm very much trying to reach out to the kind of uh, disaffected traditional Labour supporter just as much as a Tory supporter, because I think they've got an awful lot in common in terms of Nigel Farage, Nigel could have run for the leadership in any of the past three leadership elections. He didn't want to. That's fair enough. That's his decision. He hasn't gone away because he's still the leader of the UK, uh, EFDD group of where the UKIP MEPs sit in the parliament. He's in the front row of the parliament there. At the end of my one-year term, uh, because, as you know, I did that uncontested so that I could sort the mess out in the party, I will make a decision on whether I run for a four-year term or whether I don't, and that will be based on how successful I feel I've been and whether I want to do a four-year term. And that decision will have absolutely nothing to do with who the other contenders are okay. if there is a, when the election comes. So if uh, Nigel decided he wanted to walk away from... Uh, domestic politics and UKIP in the UK, that's fair enough. He, ha he had the right to make that decision. But if he wants to come back, he'll have to do it the hard way, uh, which is run for election and get the members to vote for him uh, after mid-April next year.